All right. Marta, you want to go ahead and get started here? Yes. I'm going to get right. started. Let me see. And real quickly, just before Marta um, gives her introduction, just wanted to give a quick plug that the uh, one, thank you very much, Dr. Heller, for joining us this morning. Um, Dr. Heller is doing some incredible work around Syngap epigenetics. And as many of you know, we've been um, running a fundraiser to support a postdoc in her lab. Um, so just wanted to give a plug real quickly for the fundraiser. Uh, you can find more information at charity.gofundme.com slash support dash SRF dash epigenetics. So with that, Marta, if you want to go ahead and do the introduction. Okay, then um, we're very excited again to continue the SRF webinar series. The goals of the series are getting you closer to the science, making you aware of the research that is being done and the opportunities to participate and empowering your communication with clinicians we want also to remind you that uh, we have our next webinar in the series with Dr. Connie Smith-Hicks on biomarker development, a path towards clinical trial readiness in SYNGAP1. And that's coming this week also on August 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. The to today talk is what is epigenetics and how can it accelerate therapies for SYNGAP? Today's speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Heller, who is an assistant professor of pharmacology at UPenn and also a SYNGAP caregiver. Her story is very unique as her inspiration to research SYNGAP is very personal. Her niece, now 14, was diagnosed with SYNGAP in 2016. At that time, her interest as a neuroscientist regained a focus on SYNGAP. She has first-hand knowledge of SYNGAP as a disease, and she's close to her needs and understand how SYNGAP turns a family life upside down. Dr. Heller received her PhD in molecular biology from Rockefeller University. She then studied epigenetics of drug addiction and depression. The Heller lab studies the mechanisms by which Epigenome remodeling regulates neuronal gene function and behavior. We as a group feel privileged and lucky that Dr. Heller is going to dedicate her lab to find what is outside the gene. And is, this is an area of research that hasn't been touched in SYNGA. After this introduction, I want to let you know that the record version of this webinar will be available in the SRF website. Um, by the end of the presentation, you will have opportunity to get your questions answered. We'd love to hear from you, then please write your questions in the chat. For those who join, just join us, welcome to the talk today. And the name of the talk is What is Epigenetics and How Can It Accelerate Therapies for SYNGAP? And welcome to Dr. Heller. Dr. Heller, it's all yours. All right. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Marta, for that uh, kind introduction. And um, it really is my pleasure to uh, present to you my plans for joining in the SYNGAP1 research efforts. Um, as Marta mentioned, I am the niece of a SYNGAPian, Ruby, who is pictured here. This uh, photo of my beautiful niece is from my wedding in 2012. Ruby is now 14 and um, is uh, developing actually quite beautifully. So I wanted to tell you today about um, a, a kind of a new approach to studying this disorder. So uh, in terms of the steps of this approach, the first thing that I will do um, when I join the SYNGAP research is to define what are called epigenetic mechanisms causal to SYNGAP1 expression. And I'm going to take you through what I mean by that. But first, the step of this is to actually examine published data before we generate our own. So what do we mean by epigenetic regulation of SYNGAP1? First, for those of you that are relatively new to the field of epigenetic regulation, I want, um, I'm gonna inter interrupt myself. Can you see my pointer on the screen? Yes, okay, thanks. Um, so our DNA is actually not naked inside of the cell. It is wound around histones called proteins, and this structure together, when compacted, makes up our chromosomes. And probably you saw pictures of chromosomes at some point in your education, 
And these chromosomes are so densely packed in order to fit all of our billions of uh, DNA uh, nucleotides into our very small nucleus of our cells. But not only is that structure necessary for fitting and compaction of the genome, it is also part of the way that the cell regulates gene expression, so turns the genes on and off. And that occurs by modifying either the histone proteins around which the DNA is wrapped or by modifying the DNA nucleotides themselves. These modifications to the histone proteins or the DNA are referred to as the epigenome, epi meaning on top of the genome. The epigenome is highly dynamic, it changes across development and it changes during learning or other processes that activate neurons. I actually typically study uh, neuropsychiatric diseases such as addiction and depression. And so stress and drugs of abuse can change the epigenome and gene expression as well. So when we think about what this means for turning on genes like Syngap1, when the chromatin is closed or really tightly compacted, you can see that the DNA in between these histone proteins is kind of hidden or inaccessible. And then those genes can't be turned on or used to express RNA and protein. Depending on different modifications to histones, those modifications may repel the DNA, opening up the chromatin and making the DNA accessible to the proteins and molecules that transcribe it into RNA and ultimately make the proteins. In this case, the open chromatin is elongated and the DNA is accessible and expressed. So the gene can be turned on. So you can imagine if we could control this open and closed transition, then we have a way to turn genes on and off. And that's precisely what chromatin biologists like me do uh, in the brains of animals. So the idea with respect to Syngap1, which all of you probably understand to be a haploinsufficient disorder, where the Syngapians have one good or normal wild type copy of the Syngap gene in which all of the nucleotides function as properly and the protein is expressed and functional. And then a second copy which contains a mutation and that mutation renders the gene somewhat dysfunctional or at least the protein can't get where it needs to go in order to do its work. This results in about a 50% reduction in the functional protein of Syngap1. So the idea with my approach is to turn on the good copy of the Syngap1, actually sort of turn it up, turn up the volume, turn up the expression on that gene in order to rescue that reduction in the total expression. So you could imagine if we have two copies of Syngap1 and one of them isn't working, then you have a 50% reduction. So if we could double the amount of protein coming off of the good copy, then perhaps we could rescue this disorder. In order to do that, the first approach is to define this epigenome. And I wanted to just point out the work uh, that we've done so far by Song Jun Zhu, a postdoc. Known about the epigenome of Syngap1. This was her message. I'm just happy to contribute to something with such a meaningful purpose. Again, thank you for including me in this. Given the cons conservation between human and mouse on this gene, we are poised to apply the tools available in our hands and potentially make meaningful, positive progress to the therapeutics. So Song Jun works on a completely different project. She's nearing the end of her tenure in my lab. And she was just really thrilled in the middle of all of her responsibilities to stop and pause and generate the data that I'm about to show you. So these data, we didn't generate biochemically. They're from a database of shared resources uh, across the world that are put into a kind of a biobank. And some of these resources come from analysis of the epigenome in humans, and some come from analyses of the epigenome in mice. We contribute our data to this resource, which is the ENCODE um, database, as well as the tool um, from UCSC, which is what we use to visualize the data. Now, these pictures don't look like these pictures, of course, because the data is always uh, sort of abstracted from the actual biological material. 
But what I'm showing you here is a schematic of the Syngap gene along the genome as we were looking at it at the nucleotide level. And what I have in the orange bar is a region of the genome, of the gene, that actually doesn't code for protein. It's the part of the gene, what we call upstream of the coding region, that contains information for regulating the gene. These nomenclature here refer to some of the histone proteins, those H is histone, and some of the modifications on those proteins. And when you see an enrichment here, that shows you that this histone protein has a particular modification in the promoter region. And so what Song Jun first did was to say, well, what do we know about the epigenome of this gene, SYNGAP1? What's already shown? And what I can tell you is that this modification of the histone is enriched at the promoter, and this is an on switch. So we expect that if we were to increase this signal, we could turn the gene on even more or open up the chromatin even more. And what you can see here is that the mouse genome also contains an enrichment of this modification in the promoter. And we can take advantage of this homology or sameness between the human and the mouse chromatin or epigenome to build tools that we can test in mice first and try to turn on this gene. So right away, before I even start any biochemistry or epigenetic analysis in my own lab, we already have a really rich source of data on this gene from shared resources. I just like to point out again um, that my niece's uh, haploinsufficiency mutation has been uh, identified. And that's in what we call the coding region of the gene. So separate from this orange bar. And what's important is for parents to uh, recognize that the part of the genome that we will study and we will target for therapeutic strategy is not in the same part that contains the mutations. And typically this part of the promoter would be the same in all of us and the same in all the Syngap children. So even though many patients vary in their specific mutation, the tool that we will develop will be universal to all uh, versions of the Syngap gene. In particular, we particularly want to activate the healthy copy, and that should be um, homologous amongst all of, all of the children of, with the SYNGAP1 mutation. So this strategy has far-reaching and widespread implications and doesn't require us to make mouse models of any particular child. So once we examine the published data for some leads, what we then want to do is apply our highly innovative biochemical strategies to search for the epigenome um, modifications in the epigenome specifically in the brain. The ENCODE data is not necessarily in brain. It can be in many different tissues of mouse and human. So it's a good lead, but we're really interested in modifying this gene's expression in the brain or throughout the body, but particularly in brain regions that regulate motor and, and um, learning development. The methods that we use are highly cutting edge. They involve generation of mutant mice, but these mice are not mutant for SYNGAP1. They're mutant to allow us to separate specific types of neurons by tagging them and expressing um, what's called an affinity tag just in specific cell types. The reason that's so important is that as you all know, the brain is very heterogeneous. It contains, some would say, hundreds of different cell types all intermingled. So you can't really dissect out specific type of neurons from others, nor neurons from non-neurons. And we're really interested in neurons because SYNGAP1 is a neuronal protein that functions in synapses. And we don't want any of our data, our signal, when we do our analysis to be um, diluted by signal in cell types that do not express SYNGAP1. So generating these animals and developing methods for isolating neurons first, before we even begin to analyze the SYNGAP1 epigenome is a crucial step and one that my lab is specifically, um, specifically adept to handle. We're one of the very, very few labs 
that does this type of epigenome profiling in specific cell types. In order to do that, we take advantage of another very innovative protocol developed in the last few years called cut and run. And this is a novel method to look at those histone modifications, which you can imagine pulling out one specific type of modification. There are about 200 different types of ways that histones can be modified. So pulling out one specific kind and analyzing it just at one specific gene, that's a very small signal. But we wanna be able to find that signal and amplify it in order to analyze it. And in order to do that, we use a novel technique called cut and run. Again, this is what my lab is really, really good at. This is what we focus on, even outside of the Syngap research. These are the methods that we develop in order to answer questions globally about how experience and development regulate the epigenome at specific genes. Once we define that epigenome at the Syngap1 gene, we then do something extremely important in this type of research, which is to regulate it and then see, do those epigenetic uh, changes really matter for Syngap1 expression? And we'll get more to that later. So step two of the, of the plan is to use our biochemical methods to measure the epigenome at the Syngap1 gene just in specific cell types in the brain in mammals. The next and I think most crucial step and what I believe to be my, my main contribution to neuroscience and especially to this field of study is to apply epigenetic editing to test the direct causal relevance of epigenetic modifications that we measure. So I wanna break that down a little bit for you. So as I mentioned before, we're not all well-versed in chromatin and that it's the structure of the genome inside of our cells, this highly compacted DNA and histone complex. Syngap1 expression, like all genes in the genome, is regulated by modifications to these histones and DNA, which you can see here can cause the chromatin to be closed or open, which affects whether or not a gene is on or off. One of the greatest challenges in this type of work is linking a change to the actual gene expression. So in the second step of my plan, I will find out which modifications are there. But just because a modification is present at the, the Syngap1 gene, it doesn't mean that that modification is actually going to control the gene's expression. Some of those modifications may have been useful during development, but are no longer useful um, after birth. Some may be useful only in specific windows of development, and some may be there just as part of the natural remodeling that goes on in cell divisions and actually are not specifically functional to Syngap1. One way that we can perturb modifications is by regulating the enzymes that catalyze them. So these modifications occur by specific enzymes called writer proteins. They can also be removed by enzymes called erasers. Small molecules can regulate those writers and erasers and change these modifications and rewrite the epigenome at Syngap. When you add a molecule that affects the enzyme or when you change the enzyme itself, you change the modification. Okay, I'm, tell me if I, uh, if I freeze because sometimes my internet goes out, but just, Peter, I'm looking at you for a little, some, some signal if I freeze. Um, as I was saying, if we directly regulate the enzymes that write these modifications, we will change the modification over the whole entire genome. So we may see an effect at Syngap1, but we don't know if that effect is direct or secondary. Those modifications will change other genes that could then lead to changes in Syngap1. But we don't want that. We do want to develop a tool that we can target to Syngap1 and directly turn on its expression. So how do we get at a more causal relationship? Correlation does not equal causation. In step two, when I measure the presence of modifications or when I look at them on the ENCODE database, that doesn't tell me that 
regulating them at the SYNGAP1 gene will actually change or activate SYNGAP1 expression. And that's the therapy we want. So what I pioneered in my postdoc work and what my lab is specifically focused on is using a technique called epigenetic editing. In this technique, we direct an epigenetic modification specifically to one gene. We validate that the modification is specific to that gene, and then we measure the gene's expression and downstream behaviors. In that way, we know that changing the epigenome, that specific modification actually is relevant and causally functional to a specific gene's expression and downstream behaviors. There's a lot of different tools for epigenetic editing. When I started in the field, CRISPR was just starting to come into being known uh, as, a, as an ed editing tool. But now that's the main tool that we rely on. It's not necessarily better than previous iterations in terms of its efficacy, but it is very easy to design and screen. So what you see here is the CRISPR uh, approach. In this approach, you have a molecule, a protein, derived from bacteria called Cas9. Cas9 is actually something called a ribonucleoprotein. Ribo means that it has some RNA in it, ribonucleo. It's a protein that also contains RNA, ribosomes or ribonucleoproteins. So it's an RNA plus protein molecule. The RNA shown here in yellow, which is designable, is how the CRISPR tool finds its target DNA. The RNA is designed synthetically to match the DNA that you're trying to target. So in our case, we would design an RNA molecule called a guide RNA that is homologous or matches the SYNGAP1 DNA in the promoter region. We then make a, a chimeric protein, a fusion protein, where we take the Cas9 molecule and fuse it to what we call an effector domain, or maybe one of those writer proteins that I mentioned before. When we then express this type of molecule in the mouse brain, or someday hopefully in humans, it will be um, directed by this RNA guide to the SYNGAP1 DNA, and then catalyze a change on the, hi on the histones associated with SYNGAP1 that will then open up the gene to lead to expression. For CRISPR aficionados, you may remember or know that the CRISPR Cas9 is used by bacteria to chew up DNA. It's actually a nuclease and it makes mutations. But the CRISPR Cas9 tool that we use is mutated in the protein so that it no longer cuts DNA. That's why it's called a DCAS9 or dead Cas9. It doesn't have any nuclease activity, it cannot cut DNA, but it still can bring the protein and this fused effector domain to the gene of interest. I pioneered this work as a postdoc and have expressed many, many of these types of fusion proteins in the mouse brain in vivo to affect the epigenome, gene expression, and behavior. My lab is one of the few in the world that does this, and I think I'm particularly well suited to apply this technology to SYNGAP1. So I'm sure you're wondering, can this approach really work? I know how far um, ASO technology has gone. I'm in touch with scientists working in that approach. And I think it's going to be really extremely effective. And an even more effective approach is always one that can combine deeper knowledge of gene regulation and potentially multiple model modes of therapeutic advancement. When Gavin Rumbaugh came to me to join in these efforts, and talk to um, the SYNGAP Research Fund about my work, he noted, as he did in his talk with you, that we don't even yet know how the SYNGAP1 gene is regulated. So while current therapeutics may be effective, they're potentially missing some really important information that could enhance their effectivity, make them more specific, or potentially avoid um, any nonspecific effects or potential limitations. ASO's goal is also to activate the good copy in many cases. So what about my approach? Can this really work? 
Well, it seems like it does so far in mice, not in SYNGAP1, but in a, another disorder that I'm sure many of you are very well versed in, which is Dervais syndrome. I was so fortunate to hear Gaia Colasante speak about this work last Friday at a virtual symposium at Penn on novel therapeutics for developmental disorders. Uh, Dr. Colasante and Dr. Vania Broccoli have worked with a very similar approach to activate the SCN1A gene, mutation of which is also a haploinsufficient disorder that causes a similar, somewhat similar phenotypic disorder called Dravet syndrome. So these are some of Dr. Colasante's slides and published work. And what she points out is that similar to um, SYNGAP1, Dravet syndrome is a haploinsufficient disorder in which one allele of the SCN1A gene is inactive. And in her approach, she develops an active, activating CRISPR-Cas9, a very similar tool to what I already use in my lab, with an SCN1A guide RNA to double the activation of the, S, the good copy or the SCN1A gene, which does not, in this case, affect the SCN1A um, mutated gene, which is not expressed in this context. They've made some really beautiful progress. And it's important to show that their approach relied exclusively on published ENCODE data. So they have not yet had the opportunity to analyze specific cell types for the SCN1A epigenome. And despite this, we're already able to make some progress in activating this gene. The limitations in their progress may reflect the knowledge that they so far lack, which is profiling of these types of epigenetic modifications actually in neurons. So what they did was design guides that targeted two different parts or exons of the SCN1A gene. You can see, as we do, that they screen many different guides. And that's a really important step to make sure that we can find the tool that most strongly or efficaciously activates our target gene. They then expressed um, these tools in neurons derived from two different sources. In one case, they used this tool to activate expression in a mouse model of Gervais syndrome. This model mouse is lacking an SCN1A gene, and so it could, is haploinsufficient like the human patient and has much of the same phenotype. And what you can see is that when they activate the gene using this DCAS9, BP64 is that effector region, the activator, as well as the guide for SCN1A gene, the Dravet gene, you can see this big increase in the expression of SCN1A in these neurons. This is, again, in the context of only one They went on to express this in vivo. That requires some additional tools, which I'll get to in, in the last couple of slides. I don't want to go too deeply into the data, and I regret my bullet point summaries. I, I lapsed. But if you look at the manuscript, you'll see that in the mouse model, they were able to rescue much of the phenotype. Importantly, when they express this tool, in human-derived neurons, so these are from human iPSCs, usually uh, from fibroblasts or a cheek swab from a patient. Many of you have probably donated such material. Then these can be turned into neurons in the lab and then tested. Gavin Rumba does a lot of this work, as well as others that you've heard from throughout this series. They were able to activate the SCN1A genes expression even to some extent better than in the mouse, as well as rescue many of the phenotypic properties of these human-derived neurons. 
This shows you that a tool we developed in a mouse can be efficacious in human neurons, which is a key uh, innovation of this approach and a key step in determining if it is therapeutic potential. So I really encourage you to look at this manuscript. I'll actually throw up the citation one more time. I've shared it with Marta already, and, and I was just really, really excited to see uh, Dr. Colasante talk about this and where the work is going. Um, I'm new relatively to the field of neurodevelopment, even though I've studied uh, SYNGAP1 for many, many years since my niece was diagnosed. I don't study human iPSCs yet in my lab, and I don't study developmental disorders yet in my lab. So knowing that the approach that I use for neuropsychiatric disease is working in this context, I think it's just extremely encouraging um, and gives me even more confidence. I was pretty confident, but I, now I'm even more confident that we will, we will have really exciting results for you. So one thing that I also wanna mention that has come up in conversations with, with some of my new collaborators in the SYNGAP1 field is that in many cases, the mutated copy of SYNGAP1 makes a protein that um, needs to be degraded. So it's not just that the SYNGAP1 gene doesn't turn on at all. The mutated version actually can be expressed in many cases, but it makes a protein that's truncated and then needs to be degraded. Degrading a protein takes energy for the cell, not a tremendous amount of energy, but energy nonetheless. When we're activating the SYNGAP1 gene, if we activate the mutated copy also, perhaps we're causing the cell to generate a lot of protein that it then has to degrade. And maybe that's something we would want to avoid in order to make our tool maximally efficient and productive for improving the, the cell's function. So this is a difficult nut to crack. How do we target our tool to the region of the gene that I told you is the same in everyone, regardless of the mutation, but also make it specific to the good copy. Those two things are kind of incongruous. In this same symposium, Beverly Davidson, who is really a personal hero of mine, she's a really extremely innovative and, and a dedicated scientist for neurodevelopmental disorders, she showed some work on using this type of approach to silent the mutant Huntington disease gene. Now in this case, it's really important to silence the mutated copy because that Huntington's disease mutated gene, not only is it a bad copy in terms of not doing its correct function, it also can affect the good copy. She found, and others have found this too, that there are some small nucleotide polymorphism, so some mutations that are not deleterious, they just naturally occur over the population. And those SNPs, as we call them, may be specific to one or the other allele of the gene. So when Bev Davidson wanted to target silencing to the Huntington gene, she took advantage of the fact that using um, genome, basically gene sequencing data of the whole population, so very large data sets, she could find some naturally occurring uh, polymorphisms or changes in the genome that were specific to just the mutant copy of Huntington. They don't cause the mutation, but they tend to segregate with it in the population. It's possible that SYNGAP1 would have something similar. We don't know yet. That's something I would have to investigate in collaboration with a genome genomicist, basically a genome biologi biologist, but it shows the proof of principle that there might be some genomic elements that we could take advantage of to target our CRISPR tool just to that good copy of SYNGAP1. And again, I was really encouraged to see this type of approach already in the field and from someone with whom I can have direct collaboration with as Pam, Pam, Bev Davidson. So last Two slides. I want to um, show you a couple of slides from one of our reviews that I welcome you to look at um, just for a little bit more information on the whole idea of CRISPR-mediated uh, epigenetic editing. A couple of things we really need to think about when we're considering using this tool in neuroscience. How do we get it into the brain and how do we get it into the neurons? I'm sure you're all aware that the brain is a protected space, protected by the blood-brain barrier and any therapeutic method we need to consider how we get the tool past the blood-brain barrier 
to the specific region of interest. There are many different iterations for introducing this tool into neurons. I'm not gonna go through this now, but I want you to be aware that I'm aware of many different approaches. There are ways to purify um, just the riboprotein that I described, and maybe the cell would take that up. There are ways to transfect it. That's what we do in the lab. And there are ways to use viruses. Viruses have already been used for um, genetic gene therapies and at Penn are currently being used to cure such diseases as blindness, which isn't quite neural, but is pretty close. I think Penn is an ideal place to work on this level of therapeutic advancement. In our lab, we currently deliver our tools to the mouse using a stereotaxic method where we inject it through the skull into the brain. That's very invasive, but I don't think that that's necessarily where this story ends. I think it's also really important to mention that there are really ex excellent advances in regulating this type of tool. When do we want it to turn on? When do we want it to turn off? Where should it go? Should it be on and activating SYNGAP1 only in neurons? Which neurons and when, throughout development or just early in development? There are people at uh, Rockefeller, uh, sorry, my grad institution was Rockefeller. <laughs> there are people at Penn, that scientists at Penn, that use in utero epigenetic editing with CRISPR tools in order to affect gene expression, even prenatally. So I think that this tool has a lot of promise. And most importantly, it'll teach us much that we don't know about how the SYNGAP1 gene is regulated. So with that, I just wanna close with what would be future directions. In my lab, in my hands today and already begun, we are using and developing the, the tools and knowledge that I've presented to you. Once we develop those tools, we would then apply them in adult mouse models, at different time points, perhaps during development, perhaps in utero. We would measure gene expression over long time periods and measure behavioral correlates of learning and memory. We would also characterize synaptic structure and function. As you know, the SYNGAP1 gene has been really um, known to be crucial to uh, synapse development for many, many years since its discovery. And that is one of the phenotypes that we would want to examine um, in addition to the behavior. I would work with scientists such as Gavin Rumba and Rick Huguenier and Helen Badup and others using their already established models of cell lines and mice. So I wouldn't have to create everything from scratch, but we, together we would apply my novel tools to their existing uh, pipelines for therapeutic um, efficacy. With that, I would just like to introduce you sort of to my team. Uh, Ajinkya Sase is uh, the postdoc that gave a talk at that neurotherapeutics symposium that I mentioned. He will start this work um, before he uh, finishes at the lab, which will likely be in the coming year, 2021, and while I'm recruiting the postdoc who will take this on. Um, I also want to mention for much of the artwork that you saw and of course my funding sources and that is the last slide so I would be very grateful to take any questions and thank you for your attention thank you very much for that dr. Heller that was um, really impressive really enjoyed your presentation let me go ahead and unmute Marta here as well this was excellent and, and I mean um, um, I had the opportunity to check the paper that you shared with us this weekend, and uh, uh, something about that they couldn't, um, they, they didn't saw significant increase of the expression of the protein um, on mature neurons. Did you, did you catch, and, and that's the question yeah. we all have because we have older kids, then everybody's right. worried about that, that by the time something comes up, our kids are gonna be mine is teenager already, some of them will be teenagers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's right. Ruby is a teenager. I mean, that's exactly. So that's part of, um, right. And, you know, I think that Gina, uh, Dr. Colasante 
definitely showed that data in the talk and it's a little bit more preliminary. I think that that was like toward the end of the paper. And so I'm sure they've gone back and, and redone it. One of the limitations can be the population of IPSCs. You know, I don't know yet the specifics of that. I've reached out to her to see, you know, if we can kind of speak to what limitations they may have seen in just that particular study. But I will say um, one thing that they did that I will do differently is that the activation tool that they use is um, a, it's a it's a Cas9 fused to a viral activator. And that's great for turning a gene on really, really high. Okay, so this VP160, it's viral protein uh, 16 times 10. So what this is, is a naturally occurring viral protein that goes into a cell to activate gene expression. And they put 10 of them in tandem. So what this makes is a tool that every cell should recognize for just turning up expression. It, it, it doesn't really affect the epigenome what it does is recruit the enzymes that write the gene, so RNA polymerase. What I'm proposing to do is to actually map the natural histone modifications and to recapitulate those in the cells. What this means is that the cell has already a mechanism that it uses for turning Syngap1 on, and what I'm doing is capitalizing on that to further the activation. What that can mean is that I'm putting in a modification there that the cell then recognizes. The VP64, the VP160, it's not natural to the cells. And what that means is that in terms of the long lasting effects, once that protein is gone, so the virus doesn't necessarily express well forever. I mean, lentivirus is long lasting, but its efficacy is not necessarily long lasting. Whereas a modification that is naturally long lasting in the cell, we think may have a better chance of being functional in vivo. I find also in my hands that hyperactivating a gene is not necessarily good for the cell either. Cells have a very tight window of regulation. When you naturally activate gene expression, for example, with the learning or behavior or enrichment, the gene expression maybe goes up one and a half times, two times. The Colasante work was close to that. They don't hyperactivate, it's not up a hundred times, but it's not the natural mechanism or the natural level of activation. And I think those things are key to really doing a long lasting perturbation. Finally, I'll just say some epigenetic modifications are persistent and some are more dynamic. So we would be looking for epigenetic modifications that when we change them persist. Those are the ones that we would want to use for therapeutic intervention. And also those that we see can be effective at many stages of development. So we would be testing our tool all across the lifetime of the Syngap1 mouse model, because I think it's very key for us to see when can this gene be reactivated? Now, I know Gavin just had this recent really exciting paper that overexpression of the, of the Syngap1 gene in an adult animal, knockout animal, was able to rescue phenotype. So that's really very encouraging. Um, I think that we can, you know, we can think of that as hopeful and then go from there. Thank you. So that, I'm going to go ahead. Next? Yes. Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll read a couple of the questions from the chat here. Um, we have a question that says, do you think the Syngap1 expression modification will be one of the ones that will be useful after early development in downstream behavior, that is? Yes, I, I think so. I mean, this is, you know, very, kind of similar answer to, to the previous question from Marta is that um, based on I see Hans, thank you for putting that in about Gavin's work, you know, that when we, when the gene was switched on later in development, the mice were able to show some recovery. We have to remember how plastic the brain is. I mean, really neural development uh, goes through early adulthood. I mean, we know that, and we know that in humans with brain imaging and, and even with more invasive studies. And beyond the course of development, plasticity we accept, interestingly, in disease. 
So we can accept and understand when there is a traumatic event, when there is a brain injury, when there is exposure to an insult, we, we're able to accept that the brain can get injured, right? So let's also accept that the brain can recover. The truth is that it, is, it grows synapses all the time. So we grew up learning the neurons you're born with are the neurons you die with, well, fewer of them, but, but basically that you can't make new neurons. And that is mostly true, not entirely true, but mostly true. But new synapses is a whole other story. And making new synapses is something that occurs throughout the lifetime. We know that SYNGAP1 is a synaptic disorder. So if we put SYNGAP1 back into the system, there's not really a biological reason to think that the synapses can't recover. I would never say that we can recapitulate full development. There are critical windows. But I absolutely can say that my niece, who technically officially is outside of uh, the natural critical window for language development, which closes at age 11, continues to learn language every day, and she's 14. So I don't know that we know the critical windows for SYNGAP1 development. They're on a different developmental course. And I, both anecdotally and, and as a neurobiologist, I really will not rule out you know, being able to recover uh, part of the development later in adulthood. And I think we have good data to, to say that. We like to hear that. Um, I think Pavel had a couple of questions. Let me go ahead and unmute him real quickly here and let him just go ahead and ask. Hi, um, thank you very much, Dr. Heller. That was, that was really great and very positive. Thank you. Just wanted to ask, um, is, is there any sort of symbiotic relationship between this research and some of the other therapies we're looking at like ASOs? Is there any way we can improve it? Right. So, um, so I, I, oh, sorry, you cut out a little. I, I sorry to interrupt you. Um, we, I've spoke to Ben Prosser, who is um, a researcher at Penn, who is working on um, ASO technology for SYNGAP1 and um, I guess it's SCN1A. Is it? I can't remember now. Might be a different one. Um, he's actually made a lot of progress um, targeting ASOs to the SYNGAP1 gene in order to uh, kind of turn on the good copy. That's sort of a complicated negative, negative of a negative regulation. In talking with him, I got really excited because he has made so much progress in one sense of just characterizing this gene. So what do we expect to see when we turn this gene on? I mean, it's one thing to look for the protein, but what about the RNA? Is it expressed the same way? Just the level is one thing, but we can get into different isoforms, different versions of the gene. We now have all that data because of people working on the ASOs. So that's hugely promising. And that's a really major synergy just for the biology of this gene. In terms of the therapy, I think the, the most straightforward answer is that if the gene is open, then the ASOs get in and can, the gene can actually be expressed, right? You can imagine a scenario where the gene is closed, compacted, the ASOs can, can reach it, but the polymerase can't. So being able to open up this gene maximally or be open and then you, use sorry, ASOs you, froze for just uh, you know, simultaneously to maximize. Oh, sorry. What's the last thing you heard? Am I back? Yep. Yep. You just cut out for okay. maybe five seconds or so. Okay. So, so that I think is, you know, in terms of the biology, there's a ton of synergy and potentially in terms of the therapeutic. I think that you know, when I've talked to Ben and Gavin about this, we're basically saying the more we know about this locus, the more we understand about its regulation, the more effective every strategy will be. Even in the work that I'm doing, just characterizing when this gene is open and closed across development, that could already be hugely helpful for determining when to dose an ASO. So understanding the genes regulation across development and in neurons specifically, I think that's just key to, to you know, uh, making any therapy as effective as possible. Thank you. And just the other question was just about mosaic. Um, we have a couple of mosaic uh, presentations and i um, just wondering if you see any differences in, in that case. I don't know the answer. Um, it would to really get an answer based on data, it would require comparing 
uh, mosaic mouse models to, to total uh, haploinsufficient mouse models or iPSCs derived from different populations. That actually would probably be the better strategy. Um, I don't anticipate that it wouldn't be effective in one case or the other, but I do think it gets back to this point about gene dosage. Again, in talking with, with my new collaborators, we cannot, there, there is a potential to activate a gene and then that in itself is deleterious. The reason that there are 200 histone modifications and they're dynamic across development is because the cell regulates its proteins very tightly, especially its synaptic proteins. There's a dose, like there is for a drug, there's a protein dose that's optimal. And so in doing this work and establishing any type of therapy, um, we need to make sure that we're not hyperactivating it in a deleterious way. Sometimes hyperactivating is not a problem, but we're always trying to recapitulate the natural level. And that's why I target these natural mechanisms. I, I can't think that it would be an issue if there was slightly more than 50% because of where we're targeting. Um, but it is a really key question that we have to test. Is there any negative effect of potentially activating also the mutant copy? So that would be a major part of our investigation as it is already for, for folks working on the ASOs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Hans had a question. Let me try to find him real quickly if he's still on with us here. Hans, do you want to unmute yourself? I think I just gave you permission to. I, I don't know if I have a mic. Do you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Yep. You know, uh, Liz, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have a a great grasp of promoter regions. Can can you describe it in detail a little bit further? Just their size. Um, what's the typical like? What usually binds them for sure. the well studied versions? Absolutely. Is there anything well? Is there anything unique to the syngap promoter region? Its size or its constituents? Um, is there anything to be gained from the whole genome sequencing results that maybe some of our syngap EMs have? Is it yeah. well represented in the databases? That sort of thing. These are great questions. I do not have the answers yet. Um, we're just getting started in this, but these are exactly the questions. I, I think you, I would like you to write these down and send them to my postdoc because you're basically doing my job. It's very helpful. Um, so here's the promoter region that we know so far. I can tell you in general, the promoter regions usually go from the start of a gene, about a thousand base pairs, a thousand nucleotides upstream. Beyond that, we have what's called the enhancer region. I haven't mentioned that just for simplicity's sake, but we will also be analyzing the enhancer region. Enhancer region also has histone modifications and the enhancer region and the promoter region interact, they actually loop over in order to fully regulate the gene's expression. So far I can tell you that this gene in the human ENCODE database has these two histone modifications that we expect to see at the promoter. That's a good sign. It means that there's nothing funky off the first look. Whole exome sequencing, I think that actually is a very, very good point because those, in order to find, um, you know, SNPs, uh, naturally occurring variants that might co-segregate specifically with mutant SYNGAP1, that's exactly the data that we would need. Um, but as you know, looking at kind of whole genome consortia, sometimes you may, you, you actually know better than me, you know, how often is there a SYNGAP1 mutation that's not deleterious, right? Something in an intronic region. I mean, it would be beyond just people with a SYNGAP phenotype, but any genome with a SYNGAP variant. That's how we would sort of find the segregation. As we get into this work, we will fully characterize the SYNGAP1 promoter. What we also will look for are gene sequence motifs that direct binding of the proteins that you mentioned. So I talked about histone proteins, but if we look just at this schematic, these gray and black proteins here, when the chromatin is open, they represent the transcriptional apparatus. So as you know, genes are transcribed into RNA. That's done by a specific set of proteins, one of which is RNA polymerase, as well as a number of transcription factors. Some of those factors are always there, some of them are gene specific, and all of them are highly regulated. The DNA sequence contains binding sites 
for RNA polymerase, as well as these other transcription factors. And so one of the things we will do is what's called promoter bashing. It's when you look for sequences in the promoter that are likely to recruit transcription regulatory elements. And in fact, one of, um, I've done work and collaborated on work where we fuse our tool, I'll show you that picture. So this could be a histone modifying enzyme. It could also be a transcription factor. For the purposes of you know, regulating gene expression, they could have the same output, the gene is turned on twofold, but the mechanism is very different. The duration of effect is very different. And depending on what we see in our work, we could go in the direction of transcription factors. So, you know, Hans, as, as always, your question is on a very deep level and definitely gets to, you know, some of the more molecular biology of this approach. Thanks again. Thanks for that. Um, another question that we had here um, was, thank you for the presentation and information. Uh, probably need to watch it again to fully understand. What happens to the 50% functioning gene over time? Would it express even less with this treatment? Uh, I think you touched on this about cell regulation as I typed this, but would there be a uh, need for increasing treatment more and more to compensate in the working gene? This is such a great question. Um, yeah, it's always so exciting to talk to, you know, non-scientist scientists, basically, which is what I consider this population. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Like, how do the genes talk to each other? I mean, how do the alleles talk to each other? If the cell senses that it's gotten back to, let's say, 100% dose, how does it regulate this other copy? So what you're sort of getting at is downstream of gene expression regulatory mechanisms. So in addition to turning the gene on and off, the cell has a, a number of rec mechanisms for degrading it after it's already been expressed. So even just the RNA, sometimes it doesn't even get out of the, of the, of the nucleus. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it, it gets out, but it doesn't turn into protein. Sometimes all of that happens and then it's degraded. But yes, the cell has a lot of feedback mechanisms in order to keep that regulation tight. So one of the things we saw in the Colasante paper is that even though they use this really powerful activator, this VP160, 10 times the virus protein, the activation was only like sixfold at the protein level. And that is likely because the gene is sensing this huge upregulation. It, it has mechanisms whereby the protein level is sensed. That information is sent to the protein degradation apparatus, and then the protein is degraded. And you can imagine that then the protein signal is lowered and then the sense is gone. So there's all these really elegant feedback loops in the cell. That's why cell biologists and molecular biologists love this work. And that is exactly what we will test. I mean, that's what we're looking for in terms of the output, looking at how over time and with different perturbations, does the gene expression change both the good and the, and the mutated copy? So um, you know, you're right on the money with that question. And that's exactly what we would need to look, especially over time. In terms of you know, reading, needing to redose um, we don't know yet. I mean, my work. Done in a case done perturbations, multiple, multiple, um, epigenetic editing, you know, like over the course of the an animal, but the farthest I've looked is about a month out from the manipulation and seen effects there, but that's not very long in terms of development. So I think that we really have to go there. We have to see how long lasting is our change. Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Charlene Rigby. STXBP1. That's right. That's the Prosser gene. Pro ben Prosser has a daughter with that mutation. Thank you. That's what I was forgetting. We had another question from JJ who's asking, would it be possible to send our whole exome sequencing data to the Heller lab and would that be helpful? Yes, it really would. Um, we have the capacity to store and analyze it. We work with the high, you know, HPC, that's a, you know, a high processing cluster at Penn. Um, and we have very good support there. We do all of our own, I'll just mention that, like I have quantitative biologists in my lab and um, Ki Wen and Song Jun are two of them. And we do all of our own analysis. I actually am in the process of recruiting for this project. And I have, I'm like this close to, I've made a soft offer to a quantitative biologist 
who worked on um, genome evolution. And so, you know, he's a soft accepted. So now I'm just waiting and working on the official letter. So yeah, I'm hoping to be really ready. And actually um, this new postdoc will probably be pretty psyched to get into some genome work because I, I haven't done that before. And that's his expertise, which is always a really great synergy when uh, postdocs can bring in something new to the lab. Um, so thank you for that offer. Um, yeah, I think that, that that's a really great direction to go. I just briefly, in terms of uh, Ben Prosser, so Ben is working on SDXBP1 and also SYNGAP1. This has come up in previous conversations. I just want to mention that when I do this profiling, I get the whole genome. So I look for a specific histone modification in a specific cell type, and I analyze it across the entire genome. So I will be able to give data like these for SCN1A, STBPX1. SYNGAP1. And the reason that's important is that the more I can add value, the more likely it is for the NIH to further fund this work. And I know that you guys appreciate the complexities of funding and how important it is for us to move beyond the SYNGAP Research Fund, which is really a, start, a starting step, and into the NIH. The NIH is where the bulk of our funding will come from. Those grants are on the orders of millions of dollars over five, to five years. And so what my approach allows me to do is to provide data that many other scientists working in epilepsy and developmental disorders can use in order to build their tools and understand their genes. And so I, I, I don't know that that was fully clear from the way I presented the approach, but we really do get genome-wide uh, profiles from the approach. Perfect, and I think the last question that we have here is the, the question that I think everybody has, wants the, uh, the answer to. Um, how long before this gets into something that would be working toward drug development? So how to turn these things into drugs? I don't have the answer. I mean, that's the truth. This is really, really novel. I think that within a year, I will have certainly characterized the epigenome of Syngap1 in one, maybe to three cell types, um, hopefully more. That's already a big deal. Three cell types might not sound like a lot, but we're talking about the key neurons that uh, we likely think are regulating this disease. I also expect within the year to have developed tools that can regulate this gene's expression and to have tested them in control animals. In the second year, I expect, so, and then publish all of that, right? Apply for funding. In the second year, or maybe toward the end of the first, is where we would move into testing these tools in iPSC-derived neurons from patients and in the haploinsufficient mouse models. So perhaps by the end of the second year, we would know, can these tools rescue disease phenotype in cells and in mice? Beyond that, I am not the best person to talk about time courses for drug development. And I just wanna be perfectly straightforward with you. I'm really a basic scientist but I am in an ideal environment to learn and move into that type of development. Penn is, you know, it's a drug development center. It's a therapeutic center. We have an entire institute devoted just to this type of work. We have the Pennovation Center and I'm in the Institute for Targeted Therapies. So all the right resources are there. And I expect over the next two years sooner to get those answers in hand. Uh, Jim Wilson uh, is at Penn. He is you know, one of the really, I don't know, maybe perhaps the best in the world at gene therapy in humans, including for neurological disorders peripheral. And I believe that if there is a path towards a therapy with this tool, it can happen at Penn. But what I don't have for you is the time course. I think, uh, uh, sorry, thanks for that answer there. I think Mike, uh, did you join the call with us, Mike? I did, I'm here. Hi. Sorry, I just heard you. I think I, I thought I'd heard you. I thought you were maybe gonna jump in real quickly. 
Did you have anything that you wanted yep, to mention? Yep. You know me well. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Uh, Dr. Heller, thank you so much for this talk. And unfortunately, as every parent on this call knows, I had a doctor appointment conflict that was unmissable. So I'm going to have to watch it on video. But I want to just, I did hear the last two comments, and I just want to clarify two points. While NIH funding is the holy grail, the funding that we're we're raising right now to give to get to get your lab um, a warm uh, a, a postdoc to focus on this work is, is a critical step in terms of getting the data you need for the NIH grant, right? Correct. Little chicken eggy on correct. Got to do the work to get correct. the money to do more work. Most of the work, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the level of expectation, the, the, the threshold. It, basically, I have to have two papers, and then they'll give me money to start, if you can believe that. Right, <laughs> right. And you have multiple day jobs, right? So you run a lab and you, yeah. as, as, you know, if anyone who's, I'm sure everyone on this call has read our blog about you, but my favorite link in there is the one where one of the esteemed professors at Rockefeller wrote you a one line letter of recommendation that said, if you don't hire this woman, you're an idiot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I know you're too humble to sing your own praises, but I, I, I'm not because I'm in fundraising mode. I mean, you you are one of the one of the people at one of the best epigenetics institutes in the U.S. And we have the chance to fund a researcher to sit in your lab, benefit from your expertise, and build the knowledge around Syngap, which again, bordering on criminal humility. You know, you you emphasize that you're not a drug developer. You're you're just an epigeneticist. But that just is huge, right? So we don't have this knowledge right now, and we don't know what we don't know about Syngap until we spend the time to build, to characterize the epigenetics of Syngap. Is that, am I accurate in saying that? 100%. I mean, it, it's interestingly behind other synaptic genes like PSD95 with whom it interacts um, and, you know, glutamate receptors in terms of its regulation. I think there has been such intense focus on its function to, to great effect that um, it has a little catching up to do in terms of characterizing its regulation. Right. And I think that's the thing that parents, I mean, we as parents, when we get diagnosed, we walk in and people say, oh, it's one of the most important things, postsynaptic density, learning and memory. And that's what we walk away with. But I think a lot of us, myself included, have made the mistake of saying, okay, that's what Syngap does. It's a learning and memory thing. But there, what people don't tell us, because no one likes to emphasize what they don't know, is all the things we still don't understand about Syngap, right? Which could have a lot of answers to how we could help our kids. Um, which is just another way of, I think, thinking about what you just said in simpler terms, right? So even though we, we might know one function, the, the regulation and all the other potential things it does are still to be explored. And until we get smart people working for really smart people like you, we're not going to figure it out. Thank I'm just, you. Now I, I'm just in sales mode. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the praise. And I, I definitely am not too humble to say that the epigenetics institute that I'm a part of is is really the best in the world. I mean, I always like to joke that I learned about chromatin in a psychiatry lab, which is true. Um, I'm definitely getting my education. Um, I've learned just a tremendous amount about my own field since being at Penn and the best in the world in terms of, um, you know, uh, protein quantification approaches to the epigenome. in cell culture and culture of neurons. It's all at Penn um, and, and I can get any, you know, I, I see speakers all the time that really inform my work and I've got just a great cohort at, at CHOP. I mean, just talking with Ethan Goldberg, who is a CHOP neuroscience neurologist who organized that, that symposium on Friday, you know, just sort of emailing him on the side, thanks for a great symposium. Oh, by the way, we have, you know, PBMCs from blood that we can share with you from Syngap patients. I mean. That's the kind of place Penn is. You know, you put your feelers out there, and what comes back is extraordinary. And 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 you know that is a, a big part of my success so far, and, and will definitely be true for this project as well. Yeah, and just a last point while I'm in sales mode to all the families on here, because I've, I'm constantly urging families, obviously to support it themselves, but but also to reach out to their families and, and encourage in their circles and encourage them to support this work. I think we, everyone likes a good deal. And what I like to tell people about this project is it's a great deal on countless levels. I mean, the first is, as you just said, it's Penn, it's right? Deal. So by getting, by, by getting people running up and down the halls at Penn talking about Syngap, we, we run the risk of getting more brilliant scientists interested in Syngap. But 
we're only we're we're getting a screaming deal out of you too, right? I just I, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but we're we're hoping to pay for a postdoc for two years, but that's not the full cost of this. There's there's reagents, there's your time, there's lab space, yeah. there's a lot of other things that you're funding with money that's not coming from us. Is that? Correct. I just want to make yeah. sure I'm so, representing it. Right. Accurate. So, for, you know, for parents to understand, and, and I do think this is valuable so that you can see my buy-in essentially is that, you know, um, the Syngap Research Fund is planning to fund the, the postdoc, but not, not my salary and not my, my effort on this, nor any uh, equipment reagents or supplies, including animal costs, uh, housing them. They're, they're really, really well taken care of. I'm sure you guys already know about that. Um, you know, that's my contribution and I contribute that from, from funds that Penn garnered to me when I started my lab, as well as, you know, pulling funds together from existing grants. I also have technical support in the lab, people that, um, that I, I pay off of my grants for, you know, taking care of our animals and our equipment. And, and so that's really my contribution at this stage. You know, we hope to have the whole kit and caboodle funded to, to a large extent a couple of years down the line. But I really am dedicated. I mean, I'm taking this on out of a deep interest in the gene. It's a fascinating locus with a fascinating functional protein and a, you know, a, a long time uh, dedication to my, my niece and, and my interest from that perspective. So it is a good deal. Um, I, that always matters. That matters whenever I buy anything for the lab. So, <laughs> so you know, you can think of this as a matching program if that helps, you know. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I just, it's it's good to re it's good to reaffirm that for people because there's a lot of people on the phone who, who are giving to this and then also to take the moment to thank you for that. I mean we we're we're really grateful to have you where you are and working on this. So, well, I'm I will, excited. Uh, I'll take my sales hat off. Really exciting all the way through and and um, you know some of the best moments for me was when I talked to Ben Prosser and you know it was just like this total connection and we just got each other. And um, now I'm gonna be attending their group meeting, which is every third, every third Thursday of the month. And that's what it is, you know, getting for me to interact with other great scientists working on this. Um, you know, we get ourselves hyped up because we're, we're just so data driven. I mean, that's the real truth of it. Um, and then being data driven plus being able to have an actual impact, uh, it, it's the, the, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of how far we'll take it. So. So thank you um, yeah. for including me. No, thank you. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, is that it, Peter? Yep, I think that, um, that is. One, oh, one last thing um, for um, regarding JJ question, uh, how we can share the uh, genome sequencing or the raw data with you? Mm -hmm. Do you have, because uh, and a lot of people is gonna ask us about that. Can you, do you need to send a consent or can we just share it, the ones that we have? So I have to find out, you probably can't email it to me, <laughs> is my guess. <laughs> um, so I have to find out, because you know, I have, I have all the same, you know, HIPAA protections on all of my accounts as a clinician, but um, I'm sure that there are special portals for sending, um, you know, human data. So let me work on that, okay? Perfect. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Marta. I meant to ask yeah, that as a follow-up as well. We can take that offline and um, get that and information then, uh, distributed as well. The last question that uh, a lot of people ask when we do a, this kind of talk is, um, you know, everybody's scared of uh, gene therapy that uh, lasts forever and has side effects. Then you were talking about that you would like something long lasting, but probably no whole time lasting for life. Uh, what do you guys consider long lasting in, in, neuro, in neurology? I mean, most of the right. data comes about every three months on putting these medications, but what do you consider that? So some of the tools um, that can be developed, you know, and interesting, I mean, Gavin actually in his mouse models, he has, he has genetically modified mice, right, that um, are druggable. So you put in a gene, the gene is always there, but then you can dose a small molecule drug that you could eat. That's a really nice strategy because then there's one step that's invasive, the gene therapy step, but after that, it's non-invasive. What the drug also gives you is the temporal control. So maybe you don't want the gene on the whole lifetime, so you put the gene into the genome, so it's physically there, but it has an on switch or an off switch, usually an on off, <laughs> and then the drug is what actually activates it. Um, 
this is new, this is new to me, and this is new to the world. So I'm not speaking about anything specific. I, I'm learning, you know, more about this as I go. But that's one um, approach that, you know, we use all the time in, in small mammals that um, has track of tractability in, in humans. Risks associated with gene therapy, of course. I mean, I, I, you know, dare to mention Jim Wilson. I mean, this is, you know, this is the major catastrophe of, of the century, right? Of course. And at, yet at the same time, Jim Wilson is the most funded PI at Penn, at Penn, because his approaches really are super effective and not dangerous. Um, I think that, you know, we have to be cautious. That's a key thing. Um, and, and, you know, that's really something that we have to develop as we go forward with the potential therapy. But in terms of the temporal control, there are actually some really nice molecular tricks to address that specifically. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much again, Dr. Heller. I know that we're running up on your time limit here, so we'll be cognizant of that. I just wanted to make one quick reminder again to all of the families that have uh, watched this presentation today. If you'd like to support Dr. Heller's work, um, we are currently, we've currently raised about $83,000 toward our 127K goal. So we have just north of 40K to go. Um, and again, that link is charity.gofundme.com slash support dash SRF dash epigenetics. So thank you again, Dr. Heller. I, this has I been excellent. Um, we're, we're all, I, yes. Please, can I add one more? No, so please do. I just, is, I just want to take off my Dr. Heller hat and go into Aunt Lizzie mode. If I, if I can for a minute, I just, I want to just talk, you know, caregiver to caregiver for a minute. Um, you know, I, I've said this to, to Mike and when, when I, when Ruby was born and we, you know, went through those first couple of years of sort of figuring out what was going on and, and, you know, she didn't get her diagnosis until she was um, like 12, uh, 12, I think. So she just for a long time was pervasive developmental delay. That was the diagnosis. I was in graduate school when Ruby was born and I took care of her like all the time. I was like, you know, my brother's little sister who was a student and had no responsibility. So I was the babysitter. And I would travel with them and I stayed with them and they stayed with me. And there were members of our family that were always asking about Ruby's development, her milestones, her last appointment. And I would sometimes veer in that direction because I was a neuroscientist student, you know, and, and, and I have a scientist father. And at some point I realized Ruby had neurologists and neuroscientists and geneticists the best in the world. She was a chop, but she had one aunt. And over my time with her, I learned that the best I could do for her was really to love her as Ruby and get to know her as who she is and learn to communicate with her for who she is. She's very physical. She's very cuddly. So now she's 16 and she's still climbing on me and cuddling me. Um, I've would sleep with her for years. I slept with her because, you know, sleep is always something really dysregulated. But I didn't focus on her as a patient. I chose not to. And in doing that, I developed a stronger humanity. I really know that you as parents understand what I mean by that. Process many ways that we communicate and talk to each other and certainly many ways that we love each other. And I just want to express to you that now I'm moving in this new direction. And when I chose this path, um, it wasn't a clear yes or no. The scientist in me, it was a clear yes. But Aunt Lizzie, uh, is this going to affect my relationship with my niece? That's too precious. And so I really did go through a bit of a process with myself, with my family to choose this path and to make this new, you know, road in my relationship with my family and with my niece. And I, I know that many of the scientists are parents and I'm a little unique in that I'm an aunt, um, but I've just, I just wanted to share with you some of my experience with my niece, loving her, knowing her and seeing you know, all the ways that she's just a kid and has all her favorites and her dislikes and her likes and her things that her parents annoy her about. And there's so many things there that are 
just like my kids. And you know, that I love and hate, just like I love and hate things about my own kids, you know? And so this is really informed from who I am as a scientist and as a neuroscientist, and also really from knowing Ruby as a person. Um, and and I, I just wanted to, to end on that note, I guess, just to share that with you. We really do appreciate you sharing that. That was, I mean, that's, that's very powerful. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, great. I'm off to my next meeting, as I'm sure all of you are. Thank you so much. And uh, please reach out with, with any questions. Sounds Thank great. you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.